Ladies and gentlemen, before we launch into an auction to raise money for wild sheep conservation, we're going to introduce or reintroduce a, a very good and old friend of the Wild Sheep Foundation, a life member, a man uh, you all know, a man that is passionate about conservation, is passionate about stewardship, a man that, that has put his life to this cause. Um, he is the global vice chair for the IUCN uh, Committee for the Sustainable Use uh, and Livelihood. And he is now the founder and CEO of Conservation Visions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Shane Mahoney from Newfoundland. As always, it is a, a great pleasure to be back with you. I won't speak for very long, so I will speak very plainly. And I hope what I have to say will make a difference for the future of hunting and for the future of wildlife. As Gray has said, I have given my life to this cause, and I believe it is the noblest cause that any individual can have. I think it is the cause that binds this organization together, and it is the cause that binds so many other organizations that are dedicated to wildlife together. For ultimately, what we strive for is to keep a world where those wild others exist, and yes, we care to keep our hunting traditions alive. We are at a crossroads, ladies and gentlemen, and perhaps some of the discussions over the years that suggested we would reach this point were not listened to carefully enough, or perhaps they sounded outrageous. But the truth of the matter is, we are all at a crossroads. And as was just mentioned to us, unless every single person starts to do their part, Everything we cherish is at stake. As Fred Bear one time said, if you are not fighting for hunting, ladies and gentlemen, you are fighting against it. And we have a circumstance where general attacks on hunting are occurring on an almost daily basis. We have institutional decisions that are changing the way hunting is regulated. We have airline embargoes. We have closures of hunting shows. We have the withdrawal of entertainers from big events. And we have many reconsiderations going on in many of the leading institutions around the world. It is time for us to recognize that this is not a passing phenomenon. It is time for us to recognize collectively that if there was ever a time, if there was ever a time when the best of us is demanded, it is now. There is no time to defer, no time to delay, no time to leave it to somebody else. The time has come now for the millions, the millions of people in Canada and the United States who live this tradition, who believe in this culture, to stand, stand and make a difference for the future of hunting. As I describe it, ladies and gentlemen, the age of disbelief is over. And if there's anyone sitting in this room who believes that this episode will pass, I am telling you, you are wrong. If you saw the traffic, the email traffic dealing with international issues today on hunting, you would be absolutely appalled. We here live in the heartland of hunting the United States of America and Canada. And it is on this home ground that the future of this tradition will stand or fall. And we better be certain that we understand the reasons for our current dilemma. Because I hear a great many discussions amongst groups like this and individuals seated at tables like this that convince me that we misunderstand what is happening. And if we misunderstand what is happening, we will invest our time, our intellect, our energy, and our passion in the wrong ways. 
I disagree with some of my esteemed colleagues, maybe in this room, maybe elsewhere, who believe that this is a minority of magical people who are opposed to hunting, who are somehow pulling the strings of all these institutions around the world, buying them off, influencing them with, with vacant arguments. If it was only so easy, then there is a belief that this is a direct result of the social media. The social media is to blame for all of this, like blaming newspapers for raising the issues of slavery, or blaming Gutenberg for the popularity of books. The social media is a vehicle responding to the sentiments in society. Go ahead. Attack social media. Play that game without a strategy. And we will simply waste the hard-earned money that is raised in circumstances like this that hunters give generously year after year after year. I will not stand by and not comment on this. It will be a great mistake, just like it will be a great mistake to say because people name animals, that's what's wrong with this world. Well, let us remember that the Greeks and Romans named their animals. Let us remember that even, even the most villainous, hardcore conquistador, Cortez, named his horse. The idea that suddenly we came up with the notion of naming an animal such as Cecil is patently ridiculous. We have been doing it forever, and we shall do it forever. There was a general change, ladies and gentlemen. There was a general change in society. Do you not see the differences in your own children? Do you not see the differences in the comments of your friends and colleagues? The world is never staying in one place. It is always changing. There is a rising empathy for wildlife around the world. It is not just in North America. There is a rising empathy in China. There is a rising empathy in India. There is a rising empathy for wildlife that, if we harness it correctly, can be to the betterment of all of us and all of nature. And it is also, and this is where the message gets a little harder, it's a message every hunter in this room, every hunter in the United States, every hunter in Canada, every hunter in the world needs to listen to. Part of the reason we have arrived at this juncture is because our messages are mismatched. Our messaging, our efforts, our images, are now mismatched with a modern society. You may not like it, you may not wish to admit it, but we have to accept the fact that it is true. We have helped to get us to where we are. And if we cannot speak amongst this, amongst ourselves, then we will have no future. It is truth to power, it is truth to the movement, it is truth that will keep hunting with us, not myths and fables, not things that make us feel good. Hunting is too important for that. It is too critical, not just in our lives, but it's too critical to the future of wildlife to be played with. It is no one's right to play with it, not for institutional glory, not for the advancement of a specific cause. This is every man's business. And in the United States and Canada, every citizen has the right to expect that it is their business. So what are we going to do about this, ladies and gentlemen? What are we going to do about it? That's the question. We know where we are. Every one of you in this room knows where we are. So the question is, what are we going to do? We require a new story. We require a new narrative. We have to come to the, realize that we have to change the way we represent and talk about hunting. We have to start moving with social currents, not against them. 
We cannot as hunters hold our hands up and say, all of you in society who are opposed are wrong. We are right and therefore we cannot stand against the entire tide of public opinion. It is impossible. It is a useless exercise. As many in the political field have discovered, people who thought they were powerful, thought they were invincible, thought they could never lose, and did. We have to start getting smarter about how we talk about hunting. Why do we always want to use these adjectives trophy, recreational, sport, meat, tourism hunting. And pretty soon we'll need a dictionary to describe what hunting means. And every time we pick a word, every time we pick a word, we define an oppositional component out there in the public to come against it. Use the term sport, and people say it is wrong to hunt for sport. Use the term trophy, and people say it is wrong to hunt for a trophy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that they are confused over the terms. What matters is the terms are killing us. How long do we go on pretending it's not happening? How long do we go on using those terms? It is hunting, hunting, hunting. That's it. And every person who hunts, hunts for many reasons. And no one that I know hunts for only one. The meat, the memento, the experience, the drive, the adrenaline, the rush. All of it is combined in all of us. When the U.S. Cavalry gave beef cattle to the last remnants of the Great Plains Buffalo Indians in replacement for the animals they used to pursue when they'd bring them to the fort to give them their beef cattle. These great warriors, these amazing hunters, would not allow the animal to simply be killed. They would mount their ponies and they would chase the cows and kill them with their arrows so that they could at least experience before they took the meat that thing we know as hunting. We have to start emphasizing, ladies and gentlemen, what the public wants to hear. We know what they support. We've known it for decades. It is not something new. For 40 years, we have been doing surveys in the United States of America, 40 years that have demonstrated what the public in the United States of America supports with respect to hunting and what they do not. And now we're surprised. The statistics haven't changed in four decades. Before Mark Zuckerberg was born, before Facebook was even conceived, it was clear. They support conservation. They support the hunt if it's done ethically. They support meat hunting. They support the use of the animal. And we need to begin to articulate these things in all of our hunting. Stewardship. And yes, yes, dare I say, dare I say to the hunting world, dare I use the term that we should be empathetic. Dare I use the term, dare I suggest that we in the hunting movement should be concerned about animal welfare. Yes, I dare. I dare here and now. It means we're going to have to change almost everything, ladies and gentlemen, in some form or fashion. It means our websites and our magazines and our advertisements, our language, our conventions, our display booths. It means they're all going to have to change to some extent to emphasize those things that the public sees as worthy, as honorable, as worth supporting. We are 6% at best. And some of the latest statistics are suggesting it's quite a bit lower than that. Time for us to realize that fighting hard does not mean fighting the wrong way.
if we continue to bombard the public with the images and messages that they have told us for 40 years they are against, then I don't think we need Einsteins to advise us of the future. But some say what we need is to launch a social media campaign, ra raise $5 million, $10 million. I've heard lots of people talking about this. Let's just raise a big pile of money, get, get the cash flowing, and develop a social media campaign, and let's go out and change it. Now, that to me is absolutely patently ridiculous. If we do not change the messages that every single day are hurting us, and then turn around and develop a separate little campaign to provide the positive messages, it would be like saying to a man, you can drink the ocean if we put this thimble of fresh water in it. Yes, we need to be better at social media, but we need better messages all around, ladies and gentlemen. And with regard to science, let me only say this. I have worked in the field of science for 30 years and published now in 20 peer-reviewed journals. But I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that we are in a battle for the heart, not exactly for the mind, and we better figure out how to speak to this as much as we speak to this, or we are not going to win this war. So can we do it? Absolutely we can do it. Absolutely we can do it. Do you know why we can do it? Because we've done it before, first of all. The turn of the 20th century, hunting was despised as the cause of the decline of wildlife in the United States and Canada. True, it was commercial hunting, by and large, but people were also opposed to the pot hunters, the rural poor who needed to hunt for food. Even that form of hunting was disparaged. That's where the whole idea of recreational hunting came from, as antagonistic to that kind of hunting. We reinvented the narrative over hunting 100 years ago and did it so effectively that we rescued wildlife from the abyss of extinction, created a massive program of economic benefit to people in both Canada and the United States, and gave to every citizen of our two countries an extraordinary legacy of wildlife abundance that undoubtedly would not have existed without the support of the hunting and angling community in Canada and the United States. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the second reason why we can do it. Because our story is true. Our story is real. Our story is not fiction. It is not made up by people like me. We rescued wildlife from a circumstance of near extinction of endangerment to a point today where the abundance on this continent is absolutely astounding. Not only do we have the ungulates that we pursue, we have managed to keep the big nasty beasts with us. And for all the debate and tension over wolves and grizzly bears and mountain lions and the hunting of them, this is one of the proudest legacy of every person in this room, that we still have them, that they are not gone, that they still roam, that they can still antagonize us, still to some extent toy with us, and still to some extent make us feel afraid. These are the achievements of our hunting world. So I am calling, ladies and gentlemen, make no, make no mistake about this. I'm calling for a revolution in our approach. But I am appealing to the best in every single one of you. And I'm appealing to the best in every single person who has ever hunted or ever fished or ever thought about it or ever studied it. Whoever knew someone who did it, a father, a grandfather, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a mother, a grandmother. I'm asking every single person to draw the best from themselves so that we safeguard our tradition our culture, our freedom, 
our freedom. Our freedom to pursue this. There are generations that will come after us. They were and will be as we are now. Like us, they will inherit something. We have inherited this extraordinary legacy of abundance and beauty. The images that you see on these videos are real. They're not made up in some park. They are part of the wild legacy of every Canadian and American citizen. A priceless legacy. A legacy that, that, that can be lost and never regained. Will we be the generation? Will we be the generation to turn over something that is diminished, that is sullied, to the next? To our children, to their children? But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, I call for this revolution for them, not for us. Ultimately, I call for this revolution here for them, for the wild others that give us so much, that have given us so much throughout the entire existence of humanity and continue to this day to feed us physically, spiritually, emotionally. They are, they are the symbols of beauty. They are the symbols of perspective and balance. They are what give us an idea of creativity in their diversity. They are what show us the behaviors of ourselves in a different light as we study them and watch them. They remind us that if special places are kept intact, then special creatures will live there and thrive. And we can visit them and share in them in whatever way we wish. This, this is our purpose. This is our purpose. We have come to recognize that we are fighting the fight for hunting for all of our own personal reasons. But the greater reason is that these wild creatures will be sustained. And without us, they simply cannot be. We pay the disproportionate amount for their conservation. We lobby for them relentlessly. We form organizations such as this one, leaders in the conservation of wildlife, and we have been doing it for 125 years. We stand in the footsteps of Roosevelt, in the footsteps and shadow of Grinnell, of Hornaday, of Silu, of Capstick, of O'Connor, of Leopold, and even of men like William Faulkner, your Nobel Prize winning writer from the United States of America, who told the committee in Geneva he could not come to receive his award because he was going hunting. A true story. A true story. We stand in the shadows of these because I ask every person in this room at every table to think that even in the absence of a humanity, even in the absence of us, must there not still remain mountains? Must there not be places, great wild places, where the sun rises so hard, where the air is so thin, where our hearts can be so full, should there not always be places where those majestic wild others with their massive sweeping horns show us what real capacity in nature, 
what real wilderness is? Is it not necessary, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely necessary that this be the case? And wildness is the future of the world, ladies and gentlemen. I thank this organization for all that it does. And I thank you for all that you do individually. But I ask you, please, do not reach for simple solutions to a complex problem. Do not waste your money and time and talents going down blind alleys. Do not forget the reasons why we are here this evening for a single second. And understand that if we come together to make this fight with the intelligence and passion and commitment of those who fought it before, then 50 and 100 years from now, there still will be sheep on the mountain and there still will be wonderful people like you coming together to make sure that that dream never dies. Thank you all very much.